in a city that's experienced just about everything. That hasn't seen a top flight derby in more than 40 years. Until now. It's Derby Days Berlin. Union vs. Hertha. Their first ever meeting in the first division. Every European capital is steeped in history, but Berlin, Berlin's been through more than most. The walls of Berlin have seen an awful lot. Wars, plagues, Russians, revolutions, fascists, communists. Actually, there's several revolutions. Berlin is the most significant city in Europe, symbolically, as well as politically, as well as geographically. Nikita Khrushchev called Berlin the testicles of the West. He said, if I want to make the West scream, I squeeze on Berlin. Squeeze they did. <laughs> I think the question should be, what has Berlin not been through? Tear down this wall. The Thirty Years' War, the most brutal, wide-ranging war that Europe would see. Berlin's population was reduced by three quarters. And then there was the Prussian era, which uh, was an age of expansion, which of course means loads and loads of wars. Prussia was pretty heavy-handed when it came to war. Berlin became the capital of Prussia and eventually the capital of the German Empire. Borussia Dortmund? The term Borussia, that comes from Prussia. The Napoleonic Wars at the beginning of the 1800s. He marched into Berlin in 1805, taking the Quadriga, the statue on top of the Brandenburg Gate, with him back to Paris. And don't even get me started on what Berlin has been through during the 20th century. No, we got wars to go yet. There's more wars? Oh, yeah! How many wars has this place seen? Fucking loads! The First World War, the Second World War. Berlin had a very significant role in, in World War II. This was the nerve center of fascist Germany. And then at the end, you've got the Cold War running from the end of the Second World War until the fall of the Berlin Wall. Every European capital is a thriving hub of arts and culture. But Berlin, Berlin might just be the cultural hub of the world. Art, cubism, dadaism particularly. Music. Techno was very important to Berlin. It was also a punk rock town. Culture. The Berliner Ensemble. It's one of the greatest theatres in the world. The Berliner Philharmonie. Culture, culture, like. The first foreign language versions of Mozart's great Italian operas were done in German at Friedrich II's Opera House in the heart of Berlin. And everything that all comes together. It's a party city. The Berlin invented. They have lived under fascists, they've lived under communists. They've been told what to do an awful lot in this town. When they get their brief moments of freedom, they will party in it. Welcome to Berlin, motherfucker! The first German city to have 24-hour alcohol licensing laws. There is a bar in every corner. You have clubs where they sell toothpaste and toothbrushes and soap and everything. Why? because you don't want to go home. The headline slot at Bergheim isn't until 7 o'clock on Sunday morning. It's just warming up. I heard your clubs close at 3. That's when we start. <laughs> 48 hours, 72 hours, no matter how long you can stand. What's your stamina, London man? Every European capital has played host to migrant communities from all over the world who have helped shape the identity of those cities today. But again, none more so than Berlin. Immigration in Berlin goes back all the way to the mid 1600s. Everybody is coming here, everybody want to be here. The whole world has been making their home in Berlin ever since. People moving from other cities to come here. French Huguenots, Austrian Jewish populations. American, French and the Russian. Catholic Silesians. All the different countries like Spain and everything. There's a Kurdish community, there's a Turkish community, there's Lebanese, there's Iraqi, West African, Vietnamese, there's fucking everybody. To live in that exciting, amazing city. Everything in Berlin largely comes from its migratory history. They all influence the city with their style, culture and everything. Look at the food. The doner kebab was invented in Berlin. What, not Turkey? No, it was invented in West Berlin by Turkish immigrants. Currywurst was invented because British soldiers ha had brought curry powder and Worcester sauce on the black market. The bouletta, the famous Berlin meatball, comes from the French Huguenots. That's why it's got a French name. You look at the explosion of techno culture. Hard Wax Records in Kreuzberg found these young guys making techno in Detroit. They brought them over. Berlin is a very non-judgmental city. You really can be what you like in Berlin. 
You got the answer. You can be anything you want to be. It's got some weird people. You've got to remember the people in Berlin who are looked at in the streets and pointed at are the guys wearing suits. The naked guy walking along the streets in Berlin is the one that nobody notices. But whilst almost every European capital plays host to at least one of their country's biggest, best, or even more recognizable football clubs, Berlin, well, that's where Berlin doesn't quite follow suit. I mean, there were a couple of years when Berlin did not even have any team in the top flight. The capital didn't have a team in the yeah. top flight yeah. Yeah. of Germany. Yeah. I don't think I can think of any European country in the world that hasn't had a team in the capital in the yeah, top I flight. Think, I think it was rather unique. <laughs> and so with no major titles or even cups to the city's name in decades, as well as very rare appearances in Europe in that time, the reality is that Berlin doesn't just lag behind the big two. Munich is way smaller than Berlin. Uh, Dortmund is way smaller than Berlin. But many other clubs from much smaller German cities that are dwarfed by the capital's might. Every city in Germany is way smaller than Berlin. And they're, they're tiny towns who've won, won the league over the years. Uh, in, in, in 04, Bremen were champions. Stuttgart is not a very big city. And they won the league 12 years ago. <laughs> in 09. Fucking Wolfsburg won the league. And Wolfsburg is basically a VW plant and a couple of houses around it. And it's perhaps because of this that many in Germany don't really consider Berlin as a footballing city. The other way, other football fans around Germany refer to Berlin is when it comes to the cup final because the cup final takes place here. But scratch the surface here and it really doesn't take long to realize that Berlin, well Berlin lives for this game. And despite being a city with so much on offer, it's still football from east to west that runs this city. So is it true when people say Berlin doesn't have a football scene? Yeah, I think it's true. People, it's true. It's true. Berlin doesn't have a football scene. It has several football scenes. <laughs> several football scenes? Several football scenes. People might just not take notice of it, but if you look a little bit deeper, we see it pretty much everywhere. Berlin's football culture is as rich and deep as every other facet of culture in this city. You see it quite a lot. Graffitis. Stickers, which is obviously a big thing. Yes, like I said, Berlin was an early football hotbed. I mean, um, I mean that they gave 24 of the 86 founding teams to the DFB. Yeah, yeah, a huge amount. If you define culture being about success and being about titles and being about numbers and industry, fuck off. Then you then you have to go to Bayern Munich or you have to go to Borussia Dortmund. But uh, if you want to see real culture, real football culture, this is the place to be. In fact, Berlin has more football clubs than any other city in Germany. And whilst they may not have that many trophies in their cabinets, each and every club celebrates and represents a different sect of this incredible city. They're not defined by their success, but by the people they represent, whether it's international communities who have made their homes here. There's Bosnian clubs, there's Serbian clubs, there's Turkish clubs. Turkey M Sport from Kreuzberg, they had big crowds, seen as the representatives of the Turkish community. Turkey M Sport games were shown live on television in Turkey. There's a Jewish club, Maccabi Berlin. They play west of the city centre. They were found in the 1970s, although their roots go as far back as the 18th. Whether it's political ideologies who have made their homes here. There's SV Babelsberg 03. From just outside of Potsdam on the very edges of Berlin. They're defined by their left-wing politics. The stadium is even named after one of Berlin's greatest communist revolutionaries. BFC Dynamo Berlin. From northeast Berlin, the most successful football club in the history of East Germany. Known as the Stasi Club. This is not entirely fair, though they certainly were the favoured club of Eric Mielke, the head of the Stasi. There are fans there with right-wing political opinions, but I think to call them the majority would be a mistake. You can even see the weirdness of Berlin inherent within its football clubs. Tasmania Berlin. From Neukölln in former West Berlin. Are defined by the most catastrophic catastrophically poor season in the history of top flight German football. There's Victoria Berlin. Traditionally from southwest Berlin, were founded in the 1880s. They were three times German champions. Blauweiss Berlin from former West Berlin. Their first game in the Bundesliga in front of 80,000 people at the Olympia Stadion. And of course there's Tennis Borussia Berlin, also known as TB. A former Bundesliga club, West Berlin footballing powerhouse, defined by financial collapse after the 19 1990s and in the modern era by their left-wing politics.
You see, here in Berlin, you really get the sense that whilst yes, everyone would like to win, it's not titles they crave from the game here, but instead representation of who they are, where they're from, or what they're about. Where you're from within the city, what you represent, what you stand for, what your political views are, everything. Football is a means of Berliners' expression of their own individual community. Who are you and who is the club for you? Football represents Berlin in so many ways, more than almost anything else, apart from possibly its music. And even if the clubs here really wanted to win, the city of Berlin itself poses its own challenges to any ambitious football club. Firstly, there's the city's poor economy. Yeah, it's to do with the economy, of, of course. The lack of infrastructure, lack of opportunity to a certain extent. The East German economy is considerably weaker, even 30 years after the war off. A lot of people think, oh, Berlin, you know, it's, it's, it must be like London, so there must be lots of money there. No, it isn't. You know, the city is poor. A former mayor of Berlin, Klaus Wuberei, I think he, he captured the spirit of the city perfectly with this quote. Arm, aber sexy. Uh, in English, it would be poor, but sexy. And that kind of encapsulates the spirit of Berliners. Berlin doesn't have as much money as, say, Munich or... No. <laughs> <laughs> we don't really have a lot of money. Berlin is not the financial powerhouse of Germany. We don't really have a lot of resources. Berlin is not the industrial powerhouse of Germany. We're not that pretty, we're not that shiny. And it's certainly not the football powerhouse house of Germany. <laughs> but we don't want to. We don't need to. We, have, we, we make our money different. Then there's the never-ending chaotic nature of the city. It is a chaotic city and therefore the, the clubs are chaotic. If you look at things that are happening politically in Berlin, I mean look at the airport that's supposed to have been built. You can tell by our super airport we got. The rebuilding of the airport at Schoenerfeld, it's a complete catastrophe. You know, it's supposed to be open 10 years ago, still not open. An embarrassment for the people of Berlin. Meanwhile, the rest of Germany is saying, see, we told you about the Berliners. Berlin is a lot of things, but it's not polished. So. Well, there's a stereotype about Germany being it being very orderly, everything going according to plan, and punctual and that clean. punctual and clean. Efficiency, you are talking about punctuality. Berlin does not work in that way. This is so chaotic, it's so blah. Yeah, it's probably because you're used to your structure and your little tiny traffics and everything is so well behaved and everything. Fuck that, not in Berlin. This politician in the 80s, he said, Paris is always Paris, Berlin is never Berlin. Berlin is completely, completely bonkers. This idea of constant flux, constant change, you know, that we don't have a fixed identity. For me, as a visitor to London, I always know what to expect. You know, I've got certain things there. When I go to Paris, it's the same thing. Every train station looks different. Every train station looks different. Every train station um, has its own style, the lettering of the, of the name of the train station, the tiles, the walls. From district to district, every time you turn a corner, there's areas that look like their own small little villages depending on who, who's living there and who had an influence there. It's completely different. It looks different, it smells different, it sounds different. Berlin is always changing. We had a wall here in the middle. Before that, this used to be the, you know, the Nazi headquarters. Before that, this was one of the places of cabaret culture and crazy stuff in the 20s. So always shifting and changing. And Fucked up because you have uh, construction everywhere. Everything is building up. So in Berlin, basically, everybody has their own plan. Berlin, you see? Everything is doing their own thing. In, in chaos, there is strategy sometimes. But despite Berlin boasting so many clubs with so much character and so much history, just like the city's lack of success, today at least, with the odd exception, there's also a lack of rivalry between the capital clubs. Well, there are rivalries, don't, don't get me wrong, but I think at the end of the day, there's almost a sense of camaraderie amongst Berlin football fans because they see that they've all been through the same struggles. They've all have this, this passion for expressing themselves, of wanting to say who they are within this huge city. But that might just be changing thanks to the two biggest teams in the city today. Hertha BSC based in the West. Hertha Berlin are the biggest clubs in, in Berlin in terms of numbers, in terms of success. We are the Berlin club, we are the only Berlin club. We have a song that even says it. We're the biggest city, we're the biggest club. They are the major football club in the capital city of Europe's wealthiest country. And Union Berlin in the East. It is seen not only as being a football club, it is seen as being a fundamental part of their community. So we're red and white. We're from a suburb called Köpenick. Köpenick is almost like a little town on the fringes of southeast Berlin. It's beautiful. 
are you in the team of the city then or you? Nah, I don't think unions like, we're in the team of the city. It's not our goal to represent all of Berlin. We're a team in the city, we're an important part of the city, um, but we're not the team. It's not our mission to be like the representative of the whole city. Two clubs with fascinating identities. Hertha Berlin are known as the Alte Dame or the, the Alte Tante. The so it's the old, the old lady. It's because of their name. Because Hertha, Hertha is like a really old traditional German name. It's like being called, I don't know, Elizabeth. Around here there used to be a lot of iron workers. So we are the Iron Union. Eisen Berlin, they're made of iron. So you got two brothers who want to start a football club in here in Berlin. Berlin is, has loads and loads of legs. This is 1892. Now, this is a time when steamboats were like the thing, you know, they didn't know what to name it, so the steamboat comes down the river. The steamship was called Hertha. So they named it after that. So Hertha and Berliner Sports Club merged. Hertha BSC was created out of it. So you just say, ha ho he! Ha ho he! Two sides with incredibly unique stadiums. I mean, both stadiums are sort of symbols for the club. Uh, it's two different worlds, basically. I mean, the Olympia Stadium is opulent, it's huge, it's, it's brutal. Architecturally speaking, it's incredible, it's epic. I've never seen a stadium like that. You walk in, you feel like you're entering a coliseum yeah. due to the, the history that's so evident. It's the place where Jesse Owens won gold. Yeah. You've had World Cup finals there. Yeah. Champions League finals there. Famous Zidane headbutt. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the DFB Pokal finals uh, play there every year. Union, got got The Alte First Reihe. If you haven't been there, go there. It's fantastic. Literally surrounded by forest. As you can tell, we're surrounded by trees. Literally surrounded by a forest. That's the stadium, and that's the forest. No, it's right in the woods. It literally means a stadium at the old forest ranger's house. Completely surrounded by a forest, so whenever you walk, this one station we always walk from to get here, you have to walk through the forest to get to the stadium. It often smells like pee, but, you know. <laughs> it's almost intimate, like, it's, it's, it's a small, cute... British style. British style stadium, no running tracks. Three sides of the stadium is all standard. Yeah. I've only just realized that. Yeah. They're the only seats. The fans are, are, are so close to the pitch and the atmosphere is the better for it. 22,000 total capacity, 18,000 standing. You don't have that in England, you don't even have that in most other biggest stadiums in Germany. So three quarters of the stadium has to stand, they don't have a choice. No, they want to, they want to. Two teams with incredible support. They're both basically in the top 15 of, of uh, clubs with the most members in Germany. And Union, I think, are 15th and Hertha are 13th. Hertha has fans in every single district in Berlin. The players train in every single district of Berlin. They will advertise, they'll say, OK, well, we're training at Pankow, or we're tra training in Mazan, training wherever. And they invite kids along, and they can meet the players. And that's just part of what Hertha you does. You already mentioned that we built a stadium on our own. They needed to redevelop the stadium to be fit for uh, the new third division. But the club never had any money, and not much money, so... Yeah, but 140,000 hours of unpaid labour yeah, from fans. Yeah. They were literally mixing the concrete, laying the foundations. I know personally a number of people who've given, you know, like, I don't know, the equivalent like several months worth of free labour. I have never seen anything like it in football. Two sides who boast not so much successful histories, but more chaotic ones that fit into Berlin. Especially with Hertha and even Union last season, where they get to a certain point, you're like, oh my God, things are going so well. And then all of a sudden it's just <laughs> straight down. And you're like, what's the point in that? Union had their fair share of chaos. Uh, they were supposed to go up from the third division to the second, and they weren't allowed because they had forged bank documents. What about Hertha? Oh, how much time do you got? Almost typical Berlin, typical Hertha in the 60s and 70s, the treasurer was the owner of a funeral parlor. They were going to sell more tickets than they told uh, the authorities. But of course those tickets had to come from somewhere, so they printed them secretly and, and stuck them in, 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 in the coffins, you know? So yes, tax evasion. To a funeral parlor, yeah, yeah, yeah. that's brilliant. And two sides who aren't that focused on winning. We don't give a fuck about winning. We're the biggest city, we're the biggest club. Of course we want to win, but we don't need no trophies. We got our heart, we got our mind. We got our city, we got our club. Fuck titles! We didn't give a fuck about titles, exactly what I told you before. We come to the stadium because 
We have our friends here, we have our families here. Like I got my Hertha tattoo when we went down in the second league, just to show everybody how I support my club. I don't get it when we turn champions. Fuck y'all. I'm doing it when we're going down to make a, a statement that I'm down with my club. And people, and people will tell us, man, fucking you lost. We're like, fuck us, man, we did a great job. I love my team. When we were 18th and at the beginning of the season, we were like, so what? Chilled out, man, we're gonna rock this shit anyway. We know how to lose and we know how to get back on our feet. Because we are Berlin, fuck Munich. You know, that's how we walk into Munich. We say, bow down, the main city is there. But most importantly, two sides who don't so much represent uh, politics of left or right or an ethnic heritage, but in the modern age at least, have become the representatives of the east and west of the city. Something that with Berlin's history means arguably more than most. For 28 years, this was the divide of the world. You see, despite all the horrors Berlin's endured over the centuries, it seems to be the Cold War in times of the German divide with the infamous Wall or Mauer that has left the most visible and non-visible scars on the city today. In terms of the mindset of the modern Berlin, I think the Cold War is probably the most significant. You see, after their significant role in helping to defeat the Nazis. By April 1945, there are a million Red Army troops in a circle around Berlin. They liberate Berlin from the fascists. The Soviets remained in a large part of the east of the country, eventually integrating it into the Soviet bloc. Within the next four years, Germany itself would be divided into two official states, into communist East Germany and to capitalist West Germany. Berlin found itself smack bang in the middle of this newly formed communist country, but an agreement was made that half the city would remain as an enclave of West Germany. West Berlin was a small island within East Germany. So West Berlin was completely surrounded by, completely. East, by East Germany? Yeah. However, this divide saw many in the East flee over to the West. By 1961, it's thought that over three million people left East Germany. They call it the brain drain or something? Exactly. They were losing engineers, they were losing teachers, they were losing doctors. The communist authorities could not accept losing this many people. And so by 1961, these walls were put up all around the city by those in charge of the East to make sure they didn't lose any more citizens to the West. If you, if you talk to a German and you mention the wall, they know which wall you're talking about. You're talking about the Berlin Wall. Die Mauer. Die Mauer. You didn't get close to getting over the Berlin Wall. How traumatic was it, was that time? Hugely, hugely traumatic. I mean, people died trying to cross the wall. It was impassable. The Berlin Wall was two walls by that point. Which is called the Death Strip. And they had barbed wire. It had trip wires. They had snipers. It had an anti-truck barrier. It was lit up 24 hours a day. There was attack dogs. There were lookout towers every 100 to 150 meters. And so divided by this impenetrable wall, the people of East and West Berlin lived completely different lives for decades. Life was very significantly different on both sides of the divided Berlin. Fundamentally, the biggest difference of all was that if you lived in communist East Berlin, you were not allowed to enter West Berlin. If you lived in West Berlin, you could enter communist East Berlin. You could get a visa and you could go and visit the city. Ethnically, they weren't different. No. I guess religiously they weren't different. No. So did they even have a divide or it sounds like the divide just came up because two different governments post World War II just put up a wall and said you're different. Exactly. But then things, things would slowly change. In the late 1980s, large parts of East Berlin were crumbling. Meanwhile, West Berlin was artificially wealthy. There was a photograph taken from space, from the International Space Station, Berlin at night and you could spot a divide because East Berlin still had largely gas street lighting as opposed to West Berlin, which had largely electric street lighting, which obviously burns at a different color. The indoctrination from those in charge didn't help either. If you'd been believing the official propaganda, everything was good in your half of the city, everything was terrible on the other half of the city. I grew up considering them on the other side to be let's say the class enemy in, in, you know, in a Cold War. But by the late 80s, rebellion, dissent, and even international pressure had really escalated against the East. Oh, it was massive dissent, yeah, yeah. Churches of East Germany were becoming increasingly the home of political dissidents. Marches around the churches of major East German cities like Dresden, Leipzig, and East Berlin. They start growing in numbers. 
On November 4th, you had the biggest demonstration against the regime in East Berlin, which was, I don't know, half a million people or something like that on Alexanderplatz. And then in November of 1989, things finally gave way. Because of growing dissent, because of pressure from the Soviet Union, from the Western Allies, from their own people. East Germany, they knew they had to do something by announcing a relaxation of the travel restrictions, but they won't say when. They won't say when it's going to happen. But a man giving a press conference the next day wasn't a part of the decision-making process. Someone asked him, excuse me, Herr Schabowski, you're going to open up the Berlin Wall? And he says, yeah. And some journalist asked him, when? I think he cocked it up, basically. He just read something and went like, oh, as far as I can see, it means. He just, he genuinely got, uh, uh, <laughs> immediately. People are watching television. They see that the border will open up today. They start heading towards the checkpoints. There is now no leadership from the top whatsoever. The border guards don't know what to do. They have a choice, simple, open the gates or open fire. At 11 o'clock that night, they opened up the gates and that was the fall of the Berlin Wall. But as you can imagine, after nearly 40 years of concrete separation, the literal fall of the wall wasn't going to mean that the divide completely disappeared overnight. Die Mauer in deinem Kopf. Uh, die Mauer im Kopf, meaning, well, the literal wall has collapsed. There's, you know, the wall came down. But there's still, people think, still think in East and West. And is he from the East or is he from the West? You've got many people who had never visited the West who would still never visit the West. You've got many people who had never visited the East who would still never visit the East. It was still a divided city in many ways. There was a lot of alienation between East and West after decades of separation and there were a lot of uh, preconceptions. So an Aussie is someone from former East Berlin, a Vesi is someone from former West Berlin. Is it derogatory? Uh, maybe slightly. It can be used as an insult. The instruments were made fun of because they were isolated from the rest of the world. I would not say there is necessarily animosity. This running joke that still exists within Germany, that East Germans don't know what a banana is. But there are stereotypes that still remain. Is that as commonplace today? <sighs> I was going to say no, but then I the decades of patronizing views and being looked down upon from, from, uh, by West Germans has created these, this, this siege mentality. I moved in May to a place called Kautsdorf, not far from Köpenick, a very Eastern German, East German um, neighborhood. And we started chatting with our neighbor, a very elderly woman. And at one point she said, oh, by the way, you better not let on that you're from the West. And we went, oh. What? In fact, you often see this mentality with fans uh, of clubs from East Germany. Uh, Dynamo Dresden, for example, they sing... <laughs> Ost, 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 Deutschland. East, East Germany. Yes, and yes, they sing it really passionately. They, they well. sing it passionately, they jump, and it's really intimidating. <laughs> the idea behind this is we would, instead of being made fun of, we'd rather be feared. Now, at this point, you've got the perfect ingredients for the ultimate rivalry. I mean, you're talking two clubs on two completely opposite sides of one of the most infamous city divides in modern history. But the reality is very different. <laughs> Traditionally, there was, a, there was a long history of friendship between Hertha and Union. Naja, der, ich bin ja, wir haben ja auch eine, so eine Fanfreundschaft, Hertha Union Freunde, das ist so eine Gruppe mit 2,000 Leute und uh, die verstehen sich, wir treffen uns, wir haben auch, es gibt auch eine Facebook-Gruppe. You see, during the times of the German divide, Hertha and Union weren't rivals, but instead bonded over their desire to see the fall of the wall and a reunited Berlin. They called themselves Freunde hinter Stacheldraht, friends behind barbed wire. Und bei mir ist es so, ich habe so ja 25 D-Mark Eintritt bezahlt, bin in den Osten rübergefahren und da hieß es Hertha und Union. Da waren wir eine Freundschaft. Es gab eine richtige Fanfreundschaft. And the Union fans would be wearing hair to BSC patches on their cut-off sleeve denim jacket. This might be the derby everyone's talking about between Union and Hertha, but what many people might not realize is that these two clubs don't really consider themselves rivals. Uh, Union's traditional rivals probably are BFC Dynamo. Why do you hate Union so much? It's a bit like asking someone who supports Western, why do you support, uh, why do you hate Millwall? You know, it's 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 the old East Berlin football rivalry. And Hertha, depending on who you ask, uh, it might be uh, TB, it might be Tasmania, 
but you even be Schalke if you have some. Yeah. Why Schalke? I don't know. I don't even know the story anymore. I just know all the Hertha fans don't like Schalke. So it's okay, I don't like Schalke too. And whilst yesterday Hertha were located in the western neighborhood of Charlottenburg, for most of their existence, they've actually spent it in far more central neighborhoods, like here in Gesundbrunnen. In terms of the city, they used to be, in, it's more like the north. Their famous ground, the Plumpe, used to be there which eventually was too small for Bundesliga football. And most Hertha fans, well, as pretty as it is, they don't really want to play at the Olympia Stadion either. They are now in Charlottenburg, but they are not from Charlottenburg. It's not their home, you know? And the ground is really far outside. You know, it's about, I don't know, from here, but it's about 15 minutes by train. They get good crowd. You know, an average of 45,000 isn't a bad crowd, but it looks so much less when you're in a stadium of 75,000. You know, the sound just doesn't carry. That's crazy, but 40,000, 50,000 is su such yeah. a big number. It's bigger than most probably Premier League crowds. Yeah, they, they are well supported. That's bigger than Chelsea. Yeah. They would be a lot better off than they are now with their own ground, let's say 50,000. It would always be full, I and mean, they're trying to build one. And after the war came down, things got even friendlier. Literally, 10 months after the fall of the Berlin Wall, they played a friendly at the Olympia Stadium because they wanted to commemorate like, the, the occasion of reunification and of, 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 the, of the shared suffering during that time. It was just five marks to get in, great atmosphere, everybody loved each other. So a meeting of, of theirs was actually used for a positive thing. Exactly. Device. Exactly, it was played in the Olympia Stadium. It was a huge party. I think there was 80,000 there. Everybody enjoyed it, everyone uh, shared this moment together. From that match, however, the two occupied completely different worlds of the German football pyramid. At the turn of the century, uh, Hertha was playing in the Champions League while Union was in the fourth division, Regionalliga, which is not even a professional division. A competitive derby wasn't any closer by the end of the decade either, as in the 08-09 season, Union were playing down in the third division, whilst Hertha... And Hertha were two weeks away from winning the league. And so the possibility of a competitive Berlin derby between Die Eisen and then Die Alte Dame seemed as far away as ever. I mean, Berliners are known for being dreamers, but back then I don't think even they would have gone as far as to say that the two clubs would ever meet in a competitive derby in the league. But then, in typical Berlin style, the next season saw Hertha go down bottom of the table. Waiting for them in the second division was none other than Union Berlin. And so it was the 2010-2011 season that saw Hertha and Union meet competitively for the very first time. What was the vibe like that whole week, the first ever derby in such a historic city? Honestly, awkward. It was kind of a strange occasion. It was kind of tense. No one really knew what this meant. Yeah? Yeah, nobody really knew what to make of it exactly. No one really knew if this was supposed to be a celebration of Berlin or if it was the beginning of a beautiful hatred. The first, a 1-1 draw here at Union, saw no one really leave with a grudge. But the second occasion, this time at Hertha's Olympia Stadion, may have shifted the mood due to the result. Regarded as one of the most legendary moments in modern Union history. Union won the match 2-1, and not just won it, they won it by uh, a 25-yard free kick from their club legend, Thorsten Matuschka. The roof came off the Olympic Stadium. In the corner where all the Unyona were, suddenly flares come out, they were burning, raining down upon the fans below. I think that was the first moment where you could say this is starting to become a, a proper derby. However, that season saw Hertha BSC go straight back up to the Bundesliga before coming straight back down. Which meant there would be two more derbies. That season again saw one match drawn and one match won, but this time the victory went to Hertha at Union Stadium, which many say took the rivalry to the next level. Hertha beat Union at the Outer First Array 2-1. That was the one with the famous Christopher Quirin quote. It makes me want to vomit seeing these Vessies celebrating here in our stadium. I think that quote summed up how the, young, the newer generation was starting to see the derby. He was born in a unified Berlin. He was born after the wall came down and he was talking about Vessies. However, that season saw Hertha go straight back up again and they've stayed up since, building a solid foundation as a mid-table Bundesliga side. It went down, went up, went down and went up and stayed up now. And so the possibility of another derby was really on Union to go up and meet Hertha in the first division. Yeah, we came close a number of times, never played in the qualification game. So close in the sense of fourth, fifth, seventh, something in that, in that range. But then came the 2018-2019 season, where Union made their best push for promotion yet. 
We were the only team that was undefeated in all of Europe in the first top two divisions until I think January or February. So that was when we thought, this is serious. It all came down to the final match day where all they had to do was beat 14th place Bochum. Your only fucking job is to score against the team that's way beyond you. You know, we are way better. Just score one goal and then we go up in the first division. But in typical Berliner style, they messed it up. Man, fucked up. It was just weird because you're like, Bochum, you're like mid-table. Why are you even fighting? Just like, give it to us, you know, but... Okay, when you say it like that, it sounds like we did not a good job, man. <laughs> Let's be, I remember, I was watching, let, let, let I was watching, you, I was thinking, let me tell how you they something. fucked it? <laughs> and then, playoffs. Luckily, they had a playoff against Stuttgart to fall back on. In the first match in Stuttgart, it ended 2-2, which meant they came back to the foster lie only needing a low scoring draw at home. The last 15 minutes of that home leg is one of the tensest experiences I've ever had in a football stadium. The last 30 seconds of it were one of the most joyful experiences I have ever had in a football stadium. You drew nil nil? We drew nil nil. Best zero zero draw of my life. The scenes post match had to be seen to be believed. And in the stadium, the fans themselves had helped build. Union Berlin were going to the Bundesliga for the first time ever. Everybody pours onto the pitch. They were crying like babies. The culmination of everything, all these years of misery, everything they have given, everything that they've done for their club, whether it was the rebuilding of the stadium, whether it was actually rescuing the club itself, everything was leading up to this point where they could play in the Bundesliga. It meant so much for them as fans because they were part of this success as much as the players on the pitch were. And the thing was, the players on the pitch realised this. The players celebrated with the fans. The fans didn't celebrate with the players. There is pictures of me half naked in the middle of the stadium with a fucking bottle <laughs> sing, singing songs. And the only thing that I can remember is repeating and repeating and repeating Fucking Bayern München has to come here in this stadium. And so it's in 2019 that Berlin will finally see the first ever first division derby between Union Berlin and Hertha Berlin. And whilst the mood ahead of their second division derbies may have just been awkward, the vibes ahead of their first ever meeting in the Bundesliga are a lot more tense. It started with a campaign by Hertha. Hertha was like, trying to make the game on the 9th of November. So November 9th this year is the 30 year anniversary of the fall of the war. Yeah. It's, it's supposed to be a celebration of, um, of Berlin coming together. Two teams, two parts of the city that were once divided by a wall and by many divisions in football, meeting for the first time ever in the first division on the anniversary, the 30th anniversary of the fall of the wall. It's, it's perfect, no? I mean, I mean, I agree personally, but... Thanks to God, our club said no. He didn't want to play on that day. No. Anyone disagreed? They didn't want it to, it to be on the November 9th. For us, playing on that, on that date would be making it a bigger event than it is. Then there was the Union video. The Union video of their shirt reveal, their kit reveal, at the beginning of the season, with an Union fan in an Union kit walking under the bridge at the Olympiastadion station, our stadium, at Hertha Stadium station. You could see all the blue and white graffiti everywhere and Again, that was something that people picked up on and they were like, why are you here? Why, why are you doing this? Like... But beyond the token exchanges from both clubs, it does feel like there is still something else that's adding to this rise in tension between both sides. The upcoming derby, there's way more tension in it. This one coming up? Yeah, for sure. And I can't even tell you why. It's not about politics. What is it now, 30 years? It's not about East, West. It's not about any fucking politics. It's not necessary to talk about East and West Berlin because it's one Berlin. It's not about history. I mean, there's only four competitive derbies to talk about. Yeah. Put simply, it's about football culture in Berlin. You know, if you play like FIFA with your brother? When you play um, football, FIFA on, on PlayStation against your brother. And he's your family, you fucking love him. You call him a son of a bitch. Call him a fucking son of a bitch. Even though it's your brother. Then you want to beat him and everybody gets angry. You know, and you might, when you overreact, you take the pet, you throw it against the fucking TV. And you don't talk to each other for like one hour after the game. But then again, he's your family. But after the game, you're brothers again. And I think that's how I see the, the rival 
between them red and whites and us. In speaking to both sets of fans, you really get the sense that they both want this rivalry. They just don't want it to get too bitter. I would much prefer a friendly rivalry. Mir hier wünsche ich mir eigentlich eine eine gesunde Rivalität. I don't want everyone to be holding hands, singing Kumbaya at the derby together. Jeder kann den anderen ein bisschen anfrotzeln, so sagen. Oh, la, la. <laughs> but at the same time, this city has seen enough divides to last itself a lifetime. Aber eigentlich in Freundschaft. Ja. However, that doesn't seem to be the consensus amongst all fans. Aber es ist wahrscheinlich nicht mehr möglich. Es the older people experience something about this hate thing and politicians east west and, and actual real hatred. Real hatred and the younger people never experience something like that. It's so Weil die Jungschen hier entwickeln ja so ein Ja, so ein Hass gegenüber alle anderen und dann the younger people want to create something similar to let's say Man C and Man U. The younger generation are already, you know, more significant. Bin zu alt für den Scheiß. Is I mean, it is 2019, and the most the thing you do is trying to create yourself an enemy that you can spit up on. So then you could almost argue that the wall in the head, at least for this rivalry, isn't in the older people who experience the wall, but the younger generation. And that's the thing, the people in that stadium on Saturday will be mostly the younger generation. They're both aware of the fact that a lot more people are watching this match than had been watching the match in the second division, both nationally and internationally. So I think um, there might be a sense amongst both sets of fans that this could be the first battle in an upcoming war. All right, boom, match day in Berlin. The first time they've had a derby in seven years and the first time ever that it's been in the first division, at least between Union and Hertha. And Despite this city having a lot going on at the moment, uh, culturally and politically, all everyone's talking about, especially the papers, is this. The main thing they seem to be focusing on, however, which is quite interesting, is actually the history of friendship here. Berliner Courier says today, Berlin wins. You've got Berliner Zeitung harking back to that famous friendly where 80,000 fans sat together to celebrate the war coming down. But beyond those headlines, you start to sense that kind of tension that's going up. Probably put best here by one of the Union Players Trimmel, uh, where I live, Hertha posters don't last long. The article itself on the Friendly Friendly, it says here, it was obvious that this feeling of togetherness eventually wasn't going to last and both sides were going to go their own way. Not just obviously in divisions, but in feelings as well. And I think we've really seen evidence of that this week. I mean, a lot has been happening while we've been here. Firstly, we noted it on Wednesday, where Hertha hosted Dinamo Dresden at the end of the match as Hertha won. Instead of celebrating going to the next round, a very discernible chant from the entire Ost curve. And it was sung even louder at the training we went to yesterday. One of the most incredible trainings we've ever seen. Hundreds, if not perhaps thousands of Hertha fans rocked up to urge their beloved team on to winning the game today. It's evident that this derby has progressed into something more than that is perhaps that PlayStation rivalry we've heard from fans before. It is evident that this is the kind of rivalry now where you turn up in your hundreds of thousands 24 hours before a match to show how much it means. It is evident Berlin doesn't just have a football scene, it has a proper football rivalry going on. And how that manifests today, we're just gonna have to wait and see. All right, well you can hear from the drums and chants, you can smell from the smoke, you can feel from the atmosphere, Herta are turning up. Two hours before kickoff, there is not a free seat already.
that antagonistic moment that's going to happen, it seems inevitable thanks to fan culture and just how Derby's slowly progress. Can that be avoided in this or not really? I hope so. Uh, if anything uh, the history of this city can teach us is that divides can be overcome. However, football tends to work in a different way to the rest of the universe. <laughs> It will probably reach a point where one set of ultras or other will do something completely antagonistic and that may well be the starting shot on a much more defined rival. Well, first of all, let's clear up the myth. Berlin has a football culture, and I think now we can say it has a proper derby. I mean, the myth was busted before the game even kicked off. We're in a stadium built by the fans in the middle of a forest with three grandstands that are all standing. You've got an ancient Olympic TIFO that covers three quarters of the stadium, and an away bay that has perfectly split their colors into blue and white with choreographed jackets so that they're mimicking their club badge. If that didn't convince you, then five minutes in, when the roof almost caved in as the ball hit the crossbar, a firecracker shot across the stadium, then 10 minutes in, you must have, as we had a second round of TIFOs, two rounds of TIFOs before half time. And if the first half didn't do it for you, then the second had to. I mean, you had two pyro shows in both the home and away section, so strong, so epic, they smoked out the entire ground. So much so, the match was temporarily abandoned. And when the smoke finally did clear, the Hertha fans in that incredible blue and white choreographed block had all changed their jackets around to now mimic the stripes of their shirt. And then came that last 10 minutes where we saw how intense this rivalry had become. First, you had both sets of ultras reveal the stolen items they had got off each other. And then came the goal in the last few minutes, which turned things even nastier. If I'm honest, we were kind of hoping to see a special derby which kind of celebrated the unity of the city after everything it's gone through, but evidently it's not going that way. The Herder fans, who've been so incredible, started shooting the pyro onto the pitch and a few even deflected into the stands. And at that point, well, I think most fans don't want to see that because it puts so many other people in danger. That then had a direct consequence in the Union home end, where the Ultras they were on the pitch. They couldn't have that happen in their stadium. It's about as intense as we've ever seen. The game had ended, but the, the feelings hadn't. And so for a rivalry whose direction seemed to be unclear, well, I think after the events of last night, it seems to be taking a discernible direction. Personally, I would have loved to have seen a unique United rivalry, and I think many others would. But that, at the end of the day, is for the people of Berlin to decide. But whichever and however way you'd like to see this rivalry grow, I think we can all agree on one thing. Berlin, just like every other European capital, has a proper football scene. And now they've got a derby to match it. Shakes a tambourine, nicotine from a silver screen.